Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Beacon House School System, the organizer of the School of Tomorrow events, I'd like to welcome you all to a world of tomorrow. From darkness to light, the 12th edition of the School of Tomorrow events. And it is fully virtual. The non-profit SOP event series was launched by Beacon House in 2000 as part of its corporate social responsibility and to help inform the direction of the organization while also engaging global communities in conversations shaping the future of schools and societies. I am your moderator for today's panel discussion and my name is Azam Ali Noon. I am GM Curriculum Design at the head office Lahore and I started working at Beacon House in 2013. In between, I went for my MPhil to the University of Cambridge and returned about two years back. And it has been a pleasure being here designing curriculum and hosting such engaging events. Right. So the panel discussion today is titled Forever the Middle Child, Unpacking the Forgotten Years of Middle School. And I'd like to introduce our panelists today. First up, from Beacon House Al Khalij International School in Sharjah, we've got Miss Adiba Alam, who is in class eight. She has a passion for photography and reading, and she was part of the yearbook committee and student council at her previous school. She participated in the Beacon House Global Projects last year, and has always been interested in law and justice. She aspires to be a lawyer when she grows up. It's good to have you here, Adiba. From the Thank Defense you. Campus Lahore, my pleasure. From the Defense Campus Lahore, we've got Mr. Mustafa Wakar Ghuman. He is a diligent and articulate 13 year old middle school student. And he has achieved many laurels in various literary competitions. He is a spirited and brilliant young debater since class one. He is also a position holder in the Dawn Spelling Bee competition. And currently, I believe he is house prefect in the student council. Good to have you here as well, Mustafa. Next up, Thanks we've got, lot, my pleasure. Um, next up, we've got Ms. Narjis Heather. She is deputy head of the Jubilee campus in Karachi. And she is deputy head of the middle section. She has served as the regional senior manager training at the Beacon House South office for six years. And she has a strong background in education, ed tech, teacher training, and she has been associated with Beacon House since the last 24 years. She brings with her a rich experience of teacher training, curriculum implementation, and she has been working in diverse roles in the last 24 years. Both as a parent and as a middle school deputy head, we're counting on her to give us insights into the issues touched upon today. Good to have you here today, Nadjus. Thank you, Azam, for inviting me on this panel. It's a pleasure. Jim. Last but not least at all, we've got Professor Sikandar Ahmed Shah. Professor Sikandar Shah is a pioneering member of the Sheikh Ahmed <clears throat> Hassan School of Law at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He is currently an associate professor at the law school and is a leading expert on international law and human rights law in Pakistan. He regularly advises the government on the implementation of a number of international human rights conventions. Professor Shah has served as the legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 2012 to 13, and he is currently director of the Center for Chinese Legal Studies at LUMS. He is also the parent of a teenager and here to speak to us in that capacity. Before we Thank start you. the discussion, uh, Professor Shah, it's a pleasure to have you here. <clears throat> Before we start the actual panel discussion, I'd like to tell everyone tuning in that there will be a 10 to 12 minute question answer session and you can post your comments both on the SOTEvents.com website or if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube in the comment section under the video. So rest assured that uh, your questions will be addressed today in the last 10 to 12 minutes. I'd also like to thank our corporate sponsor UBL for sponsoring such events and the entire team for coordinating and making such events possible. Now with that, let's, let's dive in to the actual panel discussion today. 
And as I mentioned before, the topic that we've got on hand, forever the middle child unpacking the forgotten years of middle school. Why this topic? Well, historically and globally, much greater attention has been paid to the early years and on secondary school and the most important, uh, the, the counterpart actually, not the most important uh, as the debate will unfold, we'll see. The middle years are often neglected and they are put on the educational back burners, not dissimilar to the middle child syndrome. On the other hand, a myriad of educational, social, developmental and emotional issues emerge between the ages of 10 to 14 when children are emerging into adolescence and in fact thirst for a greater sense of belonging and interaction with trusted adults. That is the abstract of today's session and with that, the first question that I'm going to ask Ms. Adiba Alam from uh, uh, Beacon House Al Khalij International School. In your opinion, what are some of the major issues that middle school students face that adults today don't quite understand? Ms. Adiba? I would say that most of the issues that middle school students face mm -hmm. that most adults want to understand would be basically how the students are interacting with people, bullying and all that because there's new there's every time there's a new generation like or they find different ways to pick on students based on pick on kids based on what they like what they don't like and cyberbullying and mainly on that so what you're saying today the biggest issue that teens are facing is people are constantly building new ways of picking on other people. And whether it's face to face or online, that is one of the biggest issues that you're facing. Um, I'm going to ask Mustafa to build up on the same idea. And I'll ask you the same question. Um, uh, you know, growing up in Pakistan, you're, you're at the defense campus Lahore. What are some of the major issues that uh, you've seen um, as a team. Thank you for this opportunity. I would like to start off by saying that they not only in schools, they are problems that are faced globally by children, not by a specific school or a campus. One of the main problems is that parents like take a lot of time and effort to work, work hard for the children and they spend most of their life working for the betterment of the children. And till the age of around 13 to 15, they ex expect the payback of whatever they of effort they have put into their children. But the thing they don't get is that it is a gradual process. You don't instantly get the payback of something. It is the process of more than five to even 10 years. It's not like one, if your child goes into a specific class, like seven or eight, he will just get start getting good marks and be excellent at everything it was it is a gradual process which will take around till the child ages till 20. right right interesting um miss nurgis i'm going to ask you both as a parent and as a middle school deputy head in your opinion what are some of the major issues that you can identify today all right azam so um I have quite a lot to say, but I'll just try to summarize it that my in my experience as a person with an educational background and also as a parent and as now being part of the school, I feel that just like early years, the middle years are also a developmental stage in a child's life. This is the time of life when they develop a personality, they identify what they are comfortable in, what are their interests. Uh, whereas the focus of the middle schools globally is on uh, academics and content and grades and scoring. And nobody seems to realize that this is also an age where the child is transitioning from being a child to being an adult. So they are tweens and adolescents at this time and they have a lot of human needs which need to be catered for that directly impact their academic performance. So uh, I feel that if I could be given a chance to bring a change in the middle school, I would go for a necessary provision of an emotional counselor. As most of the issues with the children who are underperforming or who require a 
who require support in learning or intervention for learning have some sort of an emotional uh, issue going on with them that could be related to growth or a social setup or lots of other factors because the children at this age are very conscious of themselves their appearance their personality their surroundings so this is what my view is that uh, middle schools are very very geared towards results and grades and content delivery whereas uh, the emotional aspect seems to take a back seat um thank you so much for your insights ma'am narjis i completely uh, agree with what you're saying you're talking about the importance of counselors which are accessible to middle school students i'm going to ask the question to sekandar uh, shah saab as well that sir uh, what's changed i mean we also went to middle school and uh, i think we did all right i think we've turned out all right but what are some of the major changes since we were in middle school and middle school today thank you azam i think all of the concerns are extremely uh, relevant to the discussion and i also feel i mean again i can talk about this for hours both as an academic and as a uh but i think the biggest i would say how education is evolving and the distortions that are created within the sort of the sphere of education is is leading to a lot of pressures on children children not just in middle school but in in sort of older but the problem is that uh, i mean just to look at few examples how for instance technology and uh, technology is impacting children and the economic system which is increasingly becoming because i work on education holistically uh, education is impacted by the economic uh, pressures such as the political economic system of like what we are facing right now in pakistan is a new liberal education order educational order which forces a lot of our children to comply or conform with this identity that they have to create right this identity of perfection the identity of getting good grades and as a consequence not only our pressures created on them to focus on these perhaps uh, not as important areas uh, but also it um, leads to them uh, uh, you know becoming more materialistic and focus more on grades rather than other other forms of learning learning like social learning like and i think covid hasn't helped and so has technology it hasn't with the positive thing it hasn't helped because it forces a student to have an uh, identity which has to be an identity like a social identity which is which isn't a real identity it is a virtual identity where they interact with other students not just in school but outside of school through various forums these uh, like twitter and facebook and all these interactive forums and that leads to a lot of our children becoming extremely confused and at times even having to deal with issues that perhaps you deal with at a, at a more sort of mature age so i mean i'll stop there i think these are all interrelated points and during the course of the discussion perhaps some of these will come up again uh, thank you so much uh, professor professor shah because uh, you've touched upon the identity creation in this virtual world and i think it's very very important but i would like to circle back to something that miss adiba said right at the start of this panel discussion and she talked about various forms of bullying um and how it ties in with what you're saying the virtual identity adiba could you shed some light on any uh, uh, examples of bullying without going into specifics at all but what are some forms of bullying that you might have heard of um virtually in this uh, post covid virtual world body shaming and taking on the way people might appear or how they behave or how they act or what their point of view is are and i was just going to a follow up question to you is um who would a student talk to um in a situation like this would it be a parent would is there someone at school most people they should talk to somebody if they're being picked on but most people they try to ignore it 
but then it could sometimes if people just ignore it and they keep getting more and more some people might stop if you just ignore it but some people might just keep picking on you and then it doesn't stop it just gets worse and worse and then some people might feel as if they can't talk to anybody because they're afraid that that person might view them as um how do i say it different dramatic or exaggerating on some on something that somebody said which shouldn't matter but it kind of does affect how you feel very interesting points. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mustafa, you touched upon some very interesting points earlier, and I'm going to pick up the same online bullying and online presence as well. Um, do you think that shifting to online teaching and learning um, has helped with teaching and learning? Do you feel like it's making you a better student? Thank you, sir. I would like to start off by saying that uh, it's not the best opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not the best way. Physical classes are way better than, <clears throat> you know, online teaching. But at least there's something. We are just not sitting home, looking at our phones, playing games all day. We are learning something. Mm -hmm. We just have to, we even get more time at our homes and then we can revise all the concepts and stuff that we uh, get to learn from online classes and i'm going to ask you a follow-up question today you have access to three adults on this panel you have access to your teachers what are some of the things that you would like to say to your uh, teachers and your adults some concerns today what what do you think they would be one of the main uh, messages i would like to convey to parents is that everything is gradual and you should have low expectations from your children instead of demotivating them and asking them uh, to get good grades you should insist that uh, you did good you should try getting good and you should next time you should practice even more and work harder and then you will get good grades no matter what and i and they believe in their child you know because the main bonding between a parent and their child is very important if the child doesn't share any problems with their parents that's where the problems start to occur if the the parents and teachers and everyone tells the solutions to the facing problems by children. So that's a very good one. I agree. I completely agree. Um, Ms. Nargis, we've identified some major, major issues um, that children are facing today. Identity, online bullying. I like how Mustafa said that they, they've got to lower their expectations. Um, what are your thoughts on lowering expectations? Uh, like I said, Azam, that uh, counseling is a major part of development. And like we uh, give a lot of free, the concept of free play that is there in the early years. There's the structured play and then there's the free play. So I feel that in the middle school uh, timetable also, there should be much more time given to sport and coaching activities where children ex, uh, experience working with teams, working with adults who are in positions of coaching, because sport plays a very important part in personality development. Children develop skills like tolerance, uh, working together, collaboration, uh, accepting defeat and failure which is not uh, available in a purely academic environment and the lack of sporting activities at middle school level there's a lot of free play available for early years and even primary gets a lot of play uh, senior schools get a lot of team sport but hardly anything for the uh, middle school children and this current pandemic and children being locked in homes is also affecting children's emotional development because the body requires physical uh, movement and activity and this whole lockdown has affected uh, this age group particularly because they're not able to utilize their energy positively and uh, we all know that sports is also great for mind development there's a direct relationship between physical activity and mind development so uh, I feel that uh, in order to cut down the stress level of students just like uh, Mustafa said Sometimes I feel that parents' expectations are unrealistic, not high or low, but let's look uh, use the word realistic and unrealistic. Understanding what the child is interested in, what he is good at, what he wants to do, and also exploring 
what the world is like now what career options are available to children now and not just limiting them to becoming a doctor or an engineer or a banker and think of uh, you know providing the opportunities to the child to decide for himself be a decision maker in his own learning process and this is something i feel that needs to be really thought through about what the middle school should be like just like the early years has a proper environment for snack time and play time and uh, rest time this is much much needed even in the middle school because of raging hormones and uh, you know lethargy and sometimes they are hyperactive and sometimes they don't want to work so how do we deal with the uh, physical needs of those children during a school day thank you thank uh, you Mr. Uh, um i heard I you say Bit of an echo, actually. Yes. So I was yes. just going to tell you. That you talked about the importance of a regiment, even in the middle schools, for these middle schoolers. And I, I'm on board with that. But I wanted to pose a question to uh, Professor Shah. Sir, I remember I could not wait. Uh, till 4 pm because that was the time i was allowed to play outside and i feel like a regimented you know interaction with sports it did a lot uh, it did a lot of good for me but i feel that less and less teenagers are engaged in sports these days um what are your opinions on on the matter and how important do you think sports is in the life of a tween and teenager I think that's a that's a very good question, and I don't think it just limits it just limited to teenagers. I think it's applicable to even us, and even when we're older. I think uh, physical exercise and sports are absolutely necessary. Um, uh, it's a natural thing to do. It's good for the body and the mind. And as uh, the speaker before we were discussing, there's a lot of medical evidence that it leads to um, you know lessening of physical, emotional, spiritual. Stress. It also leads to teamwork, sense of defeat, as you were pointed out, like leads to you becoming more confident in yourself, understanding what the real world is like. It prepares you, and it's a form of education. And uh, and also, if there is a lot of diversity in sports, and I think there are lots of individual sports there, team sports, and all of those. I went to a few system where sports was uh, stress more than education. It is a form of education, and I think it actually leads to a symbiotic arrangement where eventually you do well when the time comes in education in your studies as well. So uh, I think that uh, coming back to the bigger issue of the ability of students uh, at this age to cope to cope with not just the crisis that I was discussing of how globalization and the economic distortions and political distortions are impacting education specifically in pakistan because we didn't have we have never had an established and strong public education system so the responsive responsibility of education primarily lies uh, if the government is failing on civil society and private institutions included so i think that we need to we need to understand the reality of where we are right now this is transient at least as far as covid goes and i think Uh, there are so many activities that our children and these students could do, which are could be sports, but could be in the nature of hobbies like trekking and like you know communally engaging with family, like uh, you know like playing with your parents, uh, you know those kind of things. But also, I want you to stress that this is also an opportunity to uh, to look at this vulnerability where we are right now and. Explore other ways where students, at least specifically at this age, can be educated about systems and problems that we as a country face, so that they become more responsible citizens, like having more awareness of human rights, of social, <clears throat> economic freedoms, of cultural awareness, of public health. Because so this is a time when they are actually. Professor, uh, I believe you are experiencing uh, technological problems. Yeah, I think I lost you. Azam, I would like to add to what Mr. Sikandar is saying when he is done. 
Um, sure. Nargis, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so uh, like he spoke about not just sport but other activities, I totally agree with it because some children are very good at art, some are very good at drama, music, like we don't have music in the middle years. And I feel that uh, music, sport, art, drama, uh, journalis uh, journalism, debates, we need societies proper coaching and societies in middle schools because all of these are life skills and they develop uh, vocabulary and diction, you know, all the skills that we need otherwise in academics, mathematical skills, thinking skills, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, and children learn this more through extra and co-curricular activities than they do in the standard classroom. Absolutely. Excellent point, man, Nargis, as well. Um, you're talking, you're touching upon some very key skills. But I'm actually going to change the uh, kind of like the lens and I'm going to ask both Diva and Mustafa to weigh in here. In one of the conversations that I was having with one of my students, I asked him what he'd like to be when he grows up. And he said to me, I'd like to be a YouTuber. Now, I have to be honest with you students today. I really didn't know what advice to give him. If he wanted to become a YouTuber, what I should tell him. Um, and what Ma'am Nargis has just said is she said that we need to focus on critical thinking, on speaking skills, auditory skills, diction. I'm going to ask Ma'am, uh, Miss Adiba first. When you talk to your friends, what are some of the things that they would like to become when they grow up? And where can they go to learn about that? Um, so one of my friends, she wants to become a storyboard director. So basically she wants to draw and write about write stories and animate them. And for that, uh, she can take special classes for that, I think. I believe there are. Um, and I believe a little bit of encouragement and, and like goes a long way if you believe in someone, they'll feel more determined to do it rather than giving up just in the beginning. Because when something goes wrong, and especially when in your you decide what goes wrong, you're more likely to give up like and might think that you're not good enough to do it. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question as a moderator. If I wanted to become a YouTuber, uh, what advice would you give me? I would tell you to go for it and just try it and see how it goes. Because there's so much that you could do if becoming there's so many different things you can upload on your on YouTube and people like and a lot of people, a bunch of people in the world something like for to watch it. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Adiva, for those uh, very encouraging words. Now I'm gonna actually set up a bit of a contrast here and ask Mr. Mustafa. Mustafa, when you have conversations with your friends. Do they have similar aspirations? Do they also want to, say, for example, become storyboarders or YouTubers, content creators? Or do you still hear from your friends that um, they'd like to become, say, for example, a doctor, uh, a, a lawyer? Nothing that there's anything wrong with being a lawyer. Uh, Professor Shasab or Adiba both want, uh, aspire to be. One is a lawyer, one aspires to be a lawyer. But Mustafa, in your conversations with your friends, what are some of the things that they would like to become? First of all, I would say that parents should have a bit of acceptability in themselves. If the children can like get a degree, a doctor degree, or even become an engineer or become a lawyer, they should have more things to do. You know, the human mind is full of capabilities. They should give more chances to this, uh, you know, children and ask them to go for whatever they like not just specifically limit them to one job or opportunity and ask them freely ask them that whatever they like they can opt for it but in that also they'll have to work hard for it and keep going on until they don't stop i i love how both of the students have really touched upon the need for encouragement from our generation so i'll switch the discussion back to uh, miss nargis and ask how are some of the ways teachers, school heads, and mentors 
uh, 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 how are they encouraging the teens and tweens of today? Like I said uh, in the beginning, Azam, that the need for an emotional counselor is uh, dire in middle schools. And you need to understand the teachers try their best. But remember that counseling is an area of expertise in, in itself and requires a lot of training. So uh, it's not all the time that the teacher might be trying to do something good for the child, but she may not have the words or she may not have the strategy to do it. So uh, whatever they are capable of, I think they try their best. But I'm not saying that all of them do a great job, but 90% of them succeed because uh, arranging one-to-one -one meetings with children, this is a routine practice. Even in my own role, I spend 70% of my day meeting students. They come to me with all sorts of issues. And one of the things I want to talk about regarding this pandemic, that we have empathy should be the top priority at the moment. Because there may be children who have suffered COVID, their parents may have suffered from it, they may have lost family members due to it. And this is the time that uh, empathy will be the top priority for schools, especially at this age, where already the children are at an age when they are confused and then uh, they have to deal with the pandemic and a life which is not what it used to be. So adjusting to the new normal is a big challenge for this age group because uh, not being able to do things the day the way they were used to. And my one suggestion would be to curriculum developers and designers to come up with what the children are good at, things like YouTube or Instagram. And these should become part of our curricula to bring in this generation to develop uh, numeracy or literacy skills along with uh, the world that they live in. The world that they live in is the world of social media and that's how they will learn the do's and don'ts of social media also becoming aware of keeping themselves safe online if these tools become part of our curriculum excellent points to really uh, reimagine rethink the existing curricula and to embed and incorporate whatever we can the skills and tools required for the future i completely agree um question for professor shah the entire teaching and learning experience in this post-COVID online world, in your opinion, how has it been for your teenage uh, child? Has, is teaching and learning happening like it should be happening? You touched upon uh, uh, issues of, you know, online identity. How is that being formulated and where do you see it going in the days ahead? So, I mean, I think we will do different things to an extent there's the online identity which is not mutually exclusive from the school and education and it's uh, but it's 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 generally developing for a lot of the generation of children uh, i would say some of it is positive some of it is negative uh, but it will have to be a role played by the school and the parents in making sure that there's a there's a there's a idea between the ability to use or develop an identity online and use online facility uh, because it has an impact on the child uh, and there's a reason why they are children because at this point in time they are developing they are not adults so the responsibility is on both the school and the family and the parents to make sure that this, this, this activity is regulated. And that's even in the case of societies abroad in liberal countries where you have freedom of expression, but then there's also you know, hate speech and making sure that society as a whole functions. There's always a balance. And what is a big challenge for all of us because of virtual learning and, uh, and not just children. I also am conducting all my classes uh, to young, some of them are teenagers, uh, is that the the inability of um, subscribability, something is not moving along uh, in, a, in, a, in a, I would say, in a, in a structured manner. So the distance thing allows even students to say, and I think this was pointed out by Adiba as well, virtually, when a student is online, and there's a lot of, uh, I would say, empirical research, not just related to education, but even the use of force in war. When you have automation, when you have distancing, then people act in different ways. Students will act differently in a classroom 
they're in a virtual classroom setting. And it becomes very hard for both the school and the parents to make sure that things are moving in a positive way and not affecting their confidence in negative ways or their learning. So I think it, it is a time to be very diligent as parents when children are using online learning tools because there is A, oversight issues, B, we don't know what's going on in their head, how they relate to other students, and C, we can't really regulate that uh, place because there's no moderator as such, right? I mean, uh, because there's interaction beyond the classroom as well. Uh, so I think it's, it, it is, I can't give you an answer whether it's a good or a bad thing in terms of my own children or children that I know of who are, you know, related. I think that um, there are days when it's a positive experience, days when it's there are negative experience. But in a country like Pakistan, where again, there's not a lot of governmental uh, protection, legal protection on how these kind of engagements take place, like defamation laws in Pakistan are weak. Schools don't have the technological ability, uh, and I'm not just talking one school, I'm talking about naturally to engage with a particular board where a government steps in and helps out. Uh, and so uh, it becomes a very hard job for us to make sure everything moves uh, in a very sort of, uh, you know, I would say structured manner. So again, I can't answer that question completely, but I would say we have to be diligent. Uh, my apologies, one second. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your comments, uh, Professor Shah. I, let's ask the students themselves. Um, so I'm going to ask Miss Adiba first. I'm going to. Today we are quite familiar. You, I'm sure, both students have taken many online classes. Yes. And I'm sure that you know of some students that attend online classes but they're not really there you see uh, the mic is mute and the camera is off so i'll ask you how has the learning experience been for you and what do you think uh, the days ahead hold uh, do you want it to continue or, or or can't you wait to come back into the classroom could you repeat what you said your voice is kind of cutting yes i was just asking you attended many online classes today and how has the learning experience been for you it's been it's been good obviously um, I'm classes but there's this thing that some students which classes that they don't think that they should be attending they just don't attend it some other students think they're not they just for example like gym class so the students they don't attend it because they think oh we're at home we don't need to leave it um and like yeah it's okay. been quite good so you're you're enjoying the online learning experience yes okay that's good that's very good um and and mustafa the same question for you you said earlier that face-to-face -face learning is so much better than online classes what are some of the issues that you've identified with online teaching and learning with online learning as a student so overall the classes have been a great experience bsu has been worthwhile but the main problems faced by children are like internet issues and stuff like that they may not even be true but there are some problems which are genuine and they need to be tackled which cannot be tackled by the school administration by the, but the students themselves. I would also quote as saying that you cannot judge the capability of a fish by saying it, asking it to climb a tree. That's the same for every student. If the student is not good at one thing, you cannot force him to do it. You can just ask him and test whatever he's good at and just tell him to go for it and work hard in that. Uh, excellent point, uh, Mustafa. You've just, uh, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, that's Albert Einstein. You know, you can't judge the excellence of a fish to uh, uh, by asking it to climb a tree. So what you're talking about, essentially, um, in the academia, we call differentiation. Uh, so let's pose the question to the uh, middle school deputy head. Nargis, how can we differentiate 
uh, for tweens and teenagers in this digital era? Uh, like, I, like I said to you, Azam, that uh, for educators, this has been like the black swan event for education, this pandemic. So whatever we didn't think of, we had to think of overnight. And one of the things that will need to change, even if we're not thinking about it, is the assessment procedures that we are following right now. And uh, online is a great opportunity by asking children to send in their recordings. We can assess their ability to speak, be coherent, the kind of vocabulary they're using. So we don't necessarily have to uh, every time assess the child on his ability to write because some children may have the vocabulary and the content and the ideas, but they just don't want to use a pencil and write. So as an uh, educator, I feel that assessment is an area which we really, really need to look at. Some children who may be very good uh, in the conceptual understanding don't do well uh, in assessment purely because of the method of assessment. So we need to come up with a variety of ways to assess children like a portfolio. Uh, would be, I think with the changing times, portfolio assessment should be something that we need to think about, which is which comprises of a mode of different ways in which the child uh, is uh, talking about his or her learning and not just limited to a pencil and paper test. Thank you so much for those comments, Nargis. Actually, let's uh, uh, ask the questions to the students themselves. So, Adiba, Ms. Adiba, tell me about the experience of assessment in online platforms. And tell me about some issues that you had taking tests and exams. Have some students been genuine? Have they been honest throughout the process? I think that with taking assessments online and the timing is that some students, they might get nervous. But, but I get nervous during any assessment because when we're giving enough time, because I want to make sure that I do everything properly, but also within the time. So I think many students get nervous about the time and then they might overthink about the answers that they put in. So they might just keep going back at what answer trying to make sure that they did it right and if some students I, I don't think anybody's done this but I feel as if some students aren't sure about the answer they might they might because we have our books at home now and there's no real way for them to make sure that the student is cheating or not the student might look through the book so you're talking about cheating. You're saying that some students might cheat while taking assessments and exams. Yes, they might. Because there's no real way to look at them and see that they're not cheating. So there is a possibility that they could cheat. I don't think they would, though, because everything is... I'm sure, I, I am sure they wouldn't cheat uh, because... You know, we're good students and we expect much better from them. But uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa from the Beacon House Defense Lahore campus, what has your experience been with online assessment? And not that anyone should cheat, but if there is no other person present there, um, is there a possibility that that can happen? Sir, I must say that BSU has been really great. And whenever we are giving exams, we have a teacher in our class who is moderating us and we have a camera in front of us. And I don't think many students would cheat, though, you know, because you have a faith in, we, as we all are Muslims. It is our responsibility and we believe that we should not cheat. And even if we cheat, we won't be able to succeed later on in our life. And many students have faced problems like Internet issues and they have they wanted to write the other answer but they have written in circle the other one but i think they can be tackled easily by students if they just pay a little bit more attention towards it but overall the school staff and everyone is doing their level best to try and accommodate students as much as they can can excellent point mustafa you're absolutely right um but now my question is to uh, uh, professor shah so this year, there were a lot of issues with external summative exams like ON A levels, where 
predicted grades went out, exams were cancelled. As the parent of a teenager who is heading towards a big summative exam, high stakes, what are some of the apprehensions that you have regarding this? Or are you very hopeful that COVID is going to end, everything's going to be okay? Uh, I mean, I understand the reality of assessments and the fact that there are some exams. I went through the OA level system myself, where you have, a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a final exam kind of a situation that sort of you know, ends in that testing, and then there's a question. Uh, but subsequently, I was I was abroad. I in the US, and I went to the US undergraduate and doctorate system. And again, it goes back to the point that I was earlier pointing out that uh, you know the great focused um, environment that we live in again just creates unnecessary pressures on children i think that education is the experience and that experience is the end not the fact that we're getting great and we need to create an environment where children do not feel that kind of pressure and that would mean both parental support but also it's the Uh, Azam, can I continue what he was saying? Absolutely, ma'am. I just I think Professor Shah is experiencing some technical problems. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, so I agree with what he said about uh, unrealistic expectations. Every child cannot get an A or an A star. So depending on the interest of the child, children who are good at mathematics may not be good at English, or children who are good at uh, Urdu may not be good in Islamia. So the expectation of parents, they need to know their own children and they need to develop a partnership with the school and try to understand the child. So uh, in order for a child to develop their confidence towards learning, it's very important that the school parent and the child have a conversation together and decide how the child can move forward and what to what extent the child's abilities can be stretched. So this is something that I feel very strongly that uh, nobody really asks the children that, do you really want to do this? Or how much of this can you actually do? I think it's very important for us as uh, you know educationalists to start asking those questions and to make that trifecta, the school, the parent, and the students. Uh, Professor Shah, would you like to finish what you were saying earlier, sir? Sorry, I have, I have an internet problem. Anyways, uh, yeah, I would want to say that specific to me, I, I think, uh, so I was explaining this, uh, these unnecessary pressures and the fact that you, the, I, for me, it's both parents and uh, the school, uh, in this particular case, our school, needs to invest in its teacher, uh, make sure that there's critical mass and depth to deal with not just COVID, but any other challenge that comes uh, our way, your way. The coming years because it's a, it's a, it's a drastically it's a dramatically changing world and education is specific to my children i mean i wouldn't have these expectations in, in terms of uh you know having sorry, assessments being having changed or uh you know not doing well enough in the COVID environment because i know life is wrong and eventually the, uh, our kids will go to the if they keep doing it they study hard they'll get their undergraduate their graduate school they'll become their doctorate education so they they will deal with it i think more importantly is to um, uh, inculcate those values i mean a uh, teaching should uh, uh, you know they shouldn't be uh, treat as as much of a thing because we need to inculcate those values in them that it doesn't really whether it's religious values or cultural or social or moral values that we shouldn't be doing it we, we shouldn't create that kind of environment or those incentives that they actually do it. So if, if they know grades are important, only then will they cheat, right? If they know that grades are not important, learning is important, then it's not going to matter. Now, of course, learning will have to be regulated because of children. That we make sure that they go through that experience, they attend classes, they're not, and that there's a responsibility is on both the students and the parents and the child, if, you know, children themselves, to make sure that the value is going through this experience. And if they go through that experience, eventually they, they will do well. It's not whether because life is not about grades, it's about living your whole life and education is just one component. So I think creating good citizens uh, and it will automatically lead them to working hard when it, they should be working hard, those experiences are important uh, and it's a long-term long goal. 
Excellent points. Um, Mr. Deeper, Professor Shah just said that grades are not that important. And it's about the learning, the experience, much more than the grades. Do you agree with this statement? What are your thoughts on this as a teenager? Yes, um, I feel as though grades aren't, aren't that important. It's how much you're able to understand what you're being taught. Because um, when there's grades involved, students tend to become more concerned that like, they're answering everything correctly. Like they, they're answering everything incorrectly more, much more than what if they're understanding what they're being taught. So you do agree with what uh, to getting good grades rather than. And uh, Mustafa, same question to you. Um, I can tell you this much. Growing up in Pakistan, I was told that grades are everything. Um, that's how I was raised. And I remember having that philosophy uh, in a very competitive school environment. How do you feel about someone saying grades are not everything and the learning experience has to be primary? Yeah, I agree with Sir Sikander. As you said, that grades are not significant. As when you are going to go for a job interview, they're not going to ask what were your grades in class seven or class eight or class nine. They're just going to look at the basics, your achievements, the goals you have accomplished and stuff like that. And as of the healthy competition, I would also like to say that when we were in the primary years and when you, we used to be little kids, we used to have healthy competitions, like children would compete for good grades and good marks and try to get uh, the best marks that, as they could. But even if they couldn't, they weren't as disappointed as they, much, as they are right now. And nowadays, if a children doesn't get expected marks, he goes into depression, he gets anxiety, and it has developed into more of a jealousy and rivalry. Even if one child is getting good marks, the others will be like, oh, he's getting good marks. We, why can't we get good marks? Why isn't that so? They won't focus or look at the hard work he's doing or the things he's going through or the hard the attention he pays to his studies and all the revision done in at his home as well as in school. Uh, Azam, I want to add to the point that Mustafa is making. He's talking about rewards and awards in a school environment. And I agree with him that we need to rethink our rewarding and awarding process and not just focus on academic achievements, but you know, overall achievements of children, that some child is now a more confident speaker, some child is a more confident artist, you know, so we need to look at just not just the end product, but the process that each child has gone through and effort is something that I feel we need to reward more than the end product. Excellent. Uh, very true. Very true. The, the reward and award process needs to be rethought as well by uh, curriculum designers and educationists. We're getting some questions in right now, and I'm going to ask uh, Professor Shah to weigh in on this. The question is, some kids will dive right into relationships in middle school. Others will stay on the sidelines. Others may not be interested at all. This is the beginning of practicing intimacy. So how can parents communicate about the differences between healthy and unhealthy relationships? And I'll ask Ms. Nargis to weigh in as well. Um, but Professor Shah, any thoughts on the matter? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these are not, uh, you know, easy questions. And it could, these could depend. I mean, every child would be different. The families are different. Some families are, I mean, no, there's no right or wrong here in terms of their social, uh, religious, uh, or, you know, their background in terms of being more conservative, being more liberal, being more. Uh, uh, you know, having a view that children should be more regulated at a younger age versus those who think that children should have more freedom and trust. So, I think these are complicated questions. I do feel that in, uh, in countries, this is we don't even have to reinvent, wheel, reinvent the wheel uh, in, in some ways because in other countries, we are, you know, more developed countries, there is a learning process where children are educated about this from. Uh, from an early age, yeah, you know, they start educating them about these things, uh, you know, in class four, three, five, six, and it's, it's an evolving 
uh, by the time children are getting into these, uh, into these uh, exposed to these kind of uh, environments, they have been educated about them. And I think it's very important to educate children that uh, you know they, they need to be prepared for uh, these kind of uh, uh, and engagements. Uh, but I think uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, we are also a different society. Uh, so much is evolving in this country, and virtual virtual learning and virtual engagements is another way where people develop bonds and relationships that are not as real as perhaps we were used to in an earlier generation, where there's more real engagements where people meet for longer periods of time, where they they, they work together on you know maybe playing sports or you know uh, meeting family or meeting friends. That is all changed because of virtual interaction. And I think that will create perhaps in children certain emotions and certain, uh, you know, certain uh, reactions that perhaps we need to think through and regulate to make sure that it doesn't affect them negatively. But again, people could be different. They've got a different understanding, uh, understanding of when consent can be provided by children to be able to engage in these kinds of They could be religious uh, sensitivities, cultural sensitivities. So I think uh, it will depend eventually on more so on the parents and the child and how they feel comfortable about this. And it has to be an informed decision. And also the school should have education, as I was earlier mentioning, educational devices and counseling to make sure that anything that happens is in the interest of the child and to, and to realize that they're engineering. And it's the responsibility of the school and the parents to make sure that uh, there's only limited consent they do have in because it will lead to other kinds of you know other kinds of problems like social problems or uh, emotional and psychological problems uh, because maybe they're not ready for these especially at this age uh, the age middle school age that we're discussing uh, yeah. and so uh, uh, and also other countries have legal mechanisms to make sure. Uh, uh, legal uh, in place to make sure that you know certain activities are not are prohibited to children. Like we know, like smoking is, and uh, you know, and, and other 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 kind of vices, which perhaps would be allowed at, at a later age. Uh, you know, marriage is another example that which is a positive mm -hmm. social cultural engagement, but that only is available after a particular age. Society does decide, and we as parents and as a community should decide. Uh, you know, uh, when children and how they should be dealt with on these issues. Very valid points. Very true. But I like how you say that we should always keep the interest of the child before anything else. And of course, of course, there are considerations which are cultural, religious, social. Um, I mean, one of my advisors would always ask me what works for whom under what circumstances. So that is, again, very important in this context as well. Ms. Narjis, do you agree with the onus of educating the teenager falls on the parent and the school? Or do you think that it is primarily the responsibility of the parent? Uh, as far as issues like these are concerned, because like uh, Mr. Sikandar already pointed out that each family's belief system and setup is different. So it's not a good idea for the school to get involved and give advice on this. The only uh, in a situation like this, the school would immediately involve the parents and let them take over because uh, we really don't want to get into the beliefs of a particular family or uh, what their views are about relationships and intimacy. They are different in different families and how they look at it. So this is how I feel about it. I completely agree with you. And, you know, we have to at times defer to the best judgment of the primary caregivers, which of course are the parents. Now being cognizant of time, we are at 314. We've got one minute left. And is there anyone on my panel that would like to make a concluding remark, something? Because this is the school of tomorrow. What does tomorrow hold? Is it bright? Uh, Mr. Mustafa, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I would like to start off by saying that the staff, the teachers, the parents, everyone has a great impact on the development and grooming of a child. So if you have a good staff like Beacon House Walton Campus as well as Beacon House Defense Campus, that is very good. The principals over there, Ms. Tamina Lodi was also very cooperative as well as the principal we have right now, Ms. Aisha Zin. 
Yes, thank you so much. We're very, very appreciative of all the efforts that the entire system has done over these unprecedented circumstances. That goes for everyone in the team and, of course, our parent body, our students abroad as well. On that intensely profound note, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, panelists and live audience, thank you so much for joining today. I think we had a very rich, very interactive between us session. I received some very interesting comments and some questions which we could not address, which we'll definitely park and address later. Once again, I'm going to thank our corporate sponsor, UBL. For all those tuned in, please remember that there are 24 live sessions going on from the 20th to the 22nd of November. Please tune in. SOTEvents.com is the website. I thank you profusely once again. Thank you, panelists.